Hi, Ralph Dimitri here with Wine Country at Work. We're way up in the valley in Napa today and visiting at the Viadera Winery. It is a fascinating place that I love coming with guests. I hope you find it as interesting as I do. So Shante, I've been here many times, as you know, with clients. Uh -huh. And I know there's a great story that goes with this winery. Could you tell me the story, please? Julia Viader, who is our founder, is uh, a very talented woman and with quite an eclectic background. Mm. And when you're trying someone's wine, wine is a combination of science and art. And you start to understand the artist, you really start to understand the art that they're putting in front of you. And the same thing's happening in the wine industry. When you have a, a beautiful glass of wine in front of you, to know the history of the winemaker, what's going on in their mind, it gives you a great reading on what type of wine that they're trying to show, what type of personality the wine may have. And to know that about Delia, uh, we'll give you a little bit of an insight into what we're doing here at Via Air. Well, you know, it's interesting. It's a wonderful contrast because her pathway to winemaking was very convoluted. Definitely. Yours, on the other hand, you're a native-born Napin. You've grown up around the industry. You've chosen the industry from apparently quite young. Sure. So you two are the complete opposites of the, of the spectrum, and yet you're in the same place, and you both seem to be very essential to the place. At least that's my impression. Sure. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a team effort. Uh, for Delia, her vision, her drive her, her, is, is a huge inspiration to me, to all the, uh, the people that work here at, at Viator Vineyards. And you know, just like any type of business, it starts at the top and works its way down. And uh, we come to work every day. We're, we're pretty inspired uh, to be here, starting with this amazing view that we have, mm. you know, working its way into the wine and the, in the glass and, and the guests that, that people like you bring in here. Um, the, uh, the owner, Delia, not only is the owner, she also does all of our payroll. She does all the compliance and you name it, she's doing it in the oh my office. Gosh. Uh, so she's a very busy woman. Uh, she has a, quite a bit of energy to say the least. That's saying a lot because <laughs> the, the, the compliance alone is a, a That's major a task job. and payroll it takes a saintly personality <laughs> by itself. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, again, sort of back to the, the science and the art, winemaking is, is like, uh, is cooking. It's science yeah, and art. Right. You put the two together, you're winemaking or, or you're a chef in a restaurant. And to be able to do the books and to be doing the winemaking is definitely you know, using two very different parts of your personality and putting them together and doing a, a great job at it. Yeah. Um, as, as far as the story here at Via Dair, it really starts with Delia, uh, born in Argentina. Her father was a wine fanatic. Oh. She says she first remembers tasting wine. She's probably six years old at the dinner table. And her dad splashes a bit of Bordeaux into a wine glass in front of her and gives her a little quiz on what she can smell, what she can taste, what she likes, what mm. she doesn't like. And she said pretty much every night after that, there was a little bit of a quiz, a little bit of a splash of Bordeaux. And as she got older, the splash got bigger. And by the time she was 12 years old, she was in love with red wine. Mm. And her dad was a Bordeaux nut, so she fell in love with Bordeaux types oh, of wines as well. The big reds. Big time. Yes. And that, that definitely sits at the, at the core of the winemaking here in Viadere. Uh, the reds, as, as we go through them, are unfiltered, they're unfined. We do organic farming out here in the vineyard. She plants the vines straight down the hill, yes. uh, like she's seen across th throughout Europe so many times. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the winemaking itself, uh, her son Alan is also our winemaker now. Uh, he was literally five years old when she first starts planting grapes in this hillside. And sort of like me, growing up in the valley, you get the wine bug, you grow up in the vineyard, you pull hoses around cellars, you get a summer job in high school, you're helping your friends replant vineyards. Right. Uh, pretty much every aspect of the industry is covered probably before you're 21. Yeah. Maybe. Do, you think, do you think one of the reasons I like, they like kids so much working in the wineries is that those little fingers can get in the vines <laughs> and get the grapes that you missed? That could be part of it. <laughs> Nothing softer than the human hand pulling right. a grape from right. the grape exactly. vine. Exactly, and that—that's the thing here. So much of the work here is done by hand. Definitely. It, 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 what's so interesting to hear this is that Dili is so hands-on. Oh yeah. That, and that's unusual with a lot of the wineries. The owners many times are quite two or three steps removed from the process. Definitely, it's—it's it's a pretty unique situation. Uh, for Delia, this is her baby. You know, she, she refers to the wines as her babies. You, know, mm. you walk through the cave and she'll be looking at a barrel and talking about this baby here and that uh. baby there. And, and uh, even the wines that she makes, you, 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 a lot of customers will ask Delia when she comes out here, and what's your favorite wine? Which, oh. which is the one that you like the best? And she'll say, well, they like my children. I like yes. them all for different reasons. Yes. 
And uh, you know, some of the wines that we make definitely give her a little bit more problems, a little bit more trouble and more struggle, which uh, <laughs> she tends to be sometimes more proud of. But they, they all have different personalities, and she loves them all for a different reason. It's very interesting. I know one of her great loves is, is Cabernet Franc. Yes. Which is a grape that's growing in popularity throughout the valley. Oh, yeah. And it seems like this particular range through here is very good for the Cab Francs. And, and he, on here on the hillside in, oh, in, yeah. in the Deer Park, it, it's such an unusual climate. And the steep vineyards here are, are extraordinary that this is a grape that has to struggle, but it's a grape that has a lot of finesse. It's not as big and muscular as the Cab Sauce. Sure. You know, it's more, it's a little more feminine, it's a little more flexible. Definitely. You know, and for, for Delia, when she, when she first comes to the Napa Valley or even comes to California, it's, it's education that ultimately brings her here. Mm. And being in love with Bordeaux type styled wines, of course, the, the favorite wine that, that, that was at the pinnacle of wines which she loved was Chateau Cheval Blanc, oh. which is heavily influenced by Cabernet Franc. Mm. And she did love the, the power, yet the elegance that that wine uh, brought to the table. And so when she first started thinking about planting grapes in this hillside in the mid 80s, her idea was to mimic Chateau Cheval Blanc oh. and do it in a Napa Valley style. Oh. And when you're dealing with Napa Valley, of course, Cabernet is yeah. the king and it's yeah. the wine that you really need to work with. And with this hillside, mentioning this hillside, this whole area, this whole vineyard faces due west. It drops into a 32 degree angle all the mm. way down to the water, which is the equivalent to a double black diamond ski slope. <laughs> In the afternoon, if you can imagine the sun tracking right over oh. the top of this vineyard, the afternoon sun is just, just gives you some amazing energy. Oh. The water down here due west of the, vineyard, of the vineyard at about 3.30 to 4 o'clock, the sun starts hitting the water, and the water turns into a giant mirror reflecting energy right up into the vineyard. Yes. And so now in t from 3 o'clock until sunset, the vine is hit in by two separate directions of the sun. And mm. with Cab Franc especially, a grape which tends to lend itself to green, uh, vegetative, mm. yes. sometimes bitter finishes, the energy, the solar heat, the energy that this vineyard gets yes. bakes the green out. Perfectly. It bakes the edge off the vineyard. And if, if you're a vegetative characteristic, you have no chance in this vineyard. Oh, yeah. It just is baked out completely. And for Delia, you, know, you talk about location, location, location. Mm. It's true with this vineyard. Mm. And uh, with, with Delia's old world philosophy, it's all about letting the vineyard express itself, mm. not getting in the way of the flavors, letting you taste the individual aspect of what this vineyard can do into, inside of a wine glass. What's the, what's the geology here? This is a, a pretty amazing spot. When Delia's father buys this property in 1981, excuse me, he buys it as a real estate investment. Oh. And it's being sold on the market as somewhere you could build a home with an unbelievable view, mm. but unusable acreage <laughs> around the rest of the property. And if, yes. if you take a look over here to the right, oh, yes. the rocky, barren hillside yeah. is what this 90-acre parcel looked like in 1981. Right. Yes. And uh, 1985, she's finishing up at UC Davis, and she comes up here and she sees this rocky, barren hillside and the water beneath the, the vineyard. Oh, yes. And throughout her life, she had been traveling with her father into Bordeaux, and Burgundy, Germany, Spain, Italy, wine tasting. And she starts thinking about all the best vineyards throughout the world that she'd ever seen. The best ones in the world were always on hillsides mm. and always somehow influenced by water. Yes. And that's when the gears start turning. Uh, the, the, the light pops on and her jaw sort of hits the ground. And she says to herself, oh my gosh, this is an absolute gold mine yeah. for a vineyard site. And she starts talking to her father about ripping out rocks to plant grape vines. <laughs> well, her father is a little bit taken back where this is a real estate investment for himself. Right. So what he actually does is talks to Delia and says, Delia, if you actually want to use this property for your future, you'll give me a 15-year business proposal. Pay me back for the property with interest. Right. Uh, she writes up a brilliant plan. They sit down together. They go through it. And by the end of the plan, he looks at her and says, Delia, this is brilliant. You have my blessing to use this. She took her plan down to the Silicon Valley Bank at St. Helena, gets a loan to plant 15 acres. And in that, like I mentioned earlier, she wants to make a Bordeaux type style blend. Mm. With the energy, the reflection, the heat on this hillside, she wants to plant her vine straight down the hill, yes. which no one had done before in the Napa Valley. Right. Uh, everyone was cutting and terracing to the hillside. It's much more common now. Oh, yeah. Uh, back then, it was crazy to plant your vine yeah. straight down the hill. And for her, you know, the philosophy degree came into play as far as the planting. Uh, she likes to say, if I was a grapevine, I'd rather the sun go right at the top of me. Right. So it'd be very balanced throughout the day. Right. Uh, and she's thinking with the canopy cut, cutting into this hillside, the canopy being perpendicular to the hills to the sun, 
Yes. The energy would bake that side of the vineyard, uh, maybe even burn the side of the vineyard mm. facing the sun. And so Delia figured she could create one canopy going straight down the hill. Right. The vines could shade each other, work with each other throughout the energy and, and make right. take advantage of that energy. And work with the natural drainage of the hill and problem. Definitely. It also came to monetary reasoning. Oh. She's thinking this 32 acre uh, vineyard, or this, excuse me, this 15 acre vineyard that she, that she got the loan for, if she cuts and, and terraces into that 32 degree angle, mm. she'd be losing so much space ah. between each row. Yes, of course. She's got to pay dad back for the property. Yeah, exactly. So she's thinking if she can plant like they did across Europe, straight down the hill, not only would you have a more balanced vine, but you could probably plant maybe 20, 30% more grape vines. Oh, it's important. Enable her to get more fruit and yes. pay father back a little bit quicker. More fruit is more fruit. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> a more fruitful operation. Yeah. The, um, the planting that she actually starts in, in the mid 80s uh, consists of only Cab and Cab Franc. Uh. And the way that she even gets the grapes in Napa Valley, and you, you, you well know this, is it's a very small community. Yes. I like to tell people it's like Mayberry here in yeah. the Napa Valley. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody's kids go to school with everybody, whether you're a winery owner yeah. uh, or a vineyard worker. Right. Uh, you, you're, all, you know, you're all in the same pool there together. So Delia, when she starts up this business, she goes to winemakers, winery owners that she knows makes great wine, and she tells them her story that she wants to start up a vineyard in the, on the base of Hell Mountain. And I'm a huge fan of your wines. Do you mind if I take clippings <laughs> from your vineyards? And most of them said, you bet, Delia. Oh, yes. We would love to give you clippings. Yes. Good luck. Yeah. So she got clippings from Spotswood, from mm. Staglin, oh. from Rick Foreman. Oh, from Caldwell nice. Vineyard, oh, nice. uh, Madrone Vineyard, uh, Bader Vineyard, oh. and she planted them in blocks across the top of the hill, the middle of the hill, the bottom of the hill, and thinking that she's going to be making a single wine right. from a single vineyard, the way that she figured she'd gain depth and complexity hmm. was by putting a quilt work of flavor throughout the different areas of the vineyard from the different vineyard managers that she or vineyard Al owners that she got wines from. Almost like a field from. blend, a traditional field blend. There you go. Right. Definitely. She really is traditional in her thinking. For sure. And, and uh, very, very, uh, very intelligent in her thinking as well. Yes. The uh, first year that we made wine here at Viadere was 1989. Mm. Uh, it was a 60%, 40% blend of Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. The first review came in and Delia definitely created quite a buzz here in the Napa Valley. It was the mid 80s. She's making some Bordeaux blend. And normally in the 80s, if you're making wine, you're making Cabernet Sauvignon, you're making Chardonnay if you're making a white wine. You might be toying with Zinfandel at that point in time. But she comes up here wanting to make a Bordeaux blend. Right. And a lot of people think she's a bit crazy. Yes. Uh, she's Which is just not a disadvantage in the winemaking business. Definitely <laughs> not. You create a buzz. People want to know. And just like just like an artist, you create yes. a buzz. People want to see yes. your art. Uh, being a woman in this industry in the 80s, there weren't a lot of women right. involved in this industry. It was a little bit of a good old boys club back mm. then. And she definitely took some flack. Uh, Robert Mondavi was a huge mentor to her and sort oh. of told her to keep her head down and keep plugging forward. And then she was pushing this industry forward. And he was a big inspiration for what she did up here as well. So she does create a buzz, and the wine spectator definitely want to taste this first vintage. And they go out and they buy a couple bottles and review that first wine, and they absolutely love the wine. They give her 90 points oh, wow. with the first vintage that's created here at the winery. What's really funny is they went out and got the bottles themselves. The, the, these days, they expect no. everything to show up on their doorstep. <laughs> oh, yeah. But they, wine spectator was a lot smaller back the, then. Definitely, yeah. This, nowadays, they send you an email and tell right. you to, yeah. to ship it down right. or bring it by. Right. Um, and with 90, Delia, 90 points, though. 90 I points. mean, right out of the, out of the box. Definitely. You look at the, the ratings, 90 points and above is something that's spectacular. Yes. And for Delia, that was her goal. One of my favorite quotes, she's gotten all types of articles and, and uh, rev reviews throughout the years. And my favorite quote from Delia on all the, on, on all the articles here in the walls, she never imagined not succeeding. Oh. And she knew from the beginning, she had the vision, the drive, the persistence that she would make a name for herself. Right. And you know, for her, I'm sure that 90 points was not a surprise. And for Delia, knowing Delia, 90 points, there's always room for improvement. Right. And, and for her at that point, she did exactly that. The second year that wine was produced here, we got 91 points. Oh. The fifth year she produces wine, she gets a phone call from the editor at the Wine Spectator. This is, again, a small community. And they let her know that their top 100 wines of the world, this is coming out in the next month's issue. And she better make sure to make, go and buy a couple copies. Oh. 
<laughs> and so she goes out and furiously rips through the first copy that she finds. And they taste 11,000 wines that year. Oh, my. She finds her name, Vieter Vineyards, listed on the top 100 wines of the world at number 14. Wow. And at that point, it's instant success. The wine collectors are calling. Oh, of course. The phone is ringing off the hook. Right. She can't sell the wine quick enough. Uh. Her father starts talking about investing in the business instead of the property. <laughs> and, uh, you know, as they say, the rest is history at that point. And for Delia, the label has not slowed down. Her average score throughout the last 25 years of ranking, wine rankings is over 91 points. Her wine's been on that wine, top 100 wines of the world list at number 38 in the world, number 14 in the world, number mm. three in the world. Oh. She's been all the way up to number two in the world. Wow. Um, sort of a comical push on her history is she got number two in the world. The next year she got number three in the world. The wine that took her spot, that pushed her aside, yes. was Chateau Cheva Blanc. Oh. <laughs> and so she was actually quite excited that Chateau Cheva Blanc pushed her aside yes. to number three. She said, if, if it was any wine in the world, yes. this is the one I'd want to do it. Well, she was probably thinking it'd be more fun if I had pushed them out a little bit. <laughs> probably so, but she was pretty excited about uh, just the placement being yeah. right next to that wine. What's amazing about these scores right out of the box is that these were relatively young vines. Oh, yeah. These weren't 30 year old vines that had had lots of time to mature and uh -huh. everything. These were young vines, obviously in an incredible location. Definitely. And a lot of vision. It is, definitely. For, yeah. for Delia, it's you know, winemaking, science, and art. And mm. it's, it's a lot of its philosophy. And it's a very old world approach. It's, it's letting the vineyard express itself, not getting in the way of the flavors. Uh, a, a, a recent article, uh, I think it was the Wine Spectator, an article, Napa, returning to grace. Uh. And, you know, from, from these giant smack-you-in-the-mouth Cabernets yeah. uh, to these more elegant, refined styles of Cabernet. And they actually cited Vieter oh. as one of these very consistently elegant, yeah. refined, graceful Cabernet-styled wines. That's how I would usually describe it. Besides just Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc, we also did plant some Petit Verdot on the hillside, mm. some Syrah, and a speck of Malbec. Oh. And so at 30 acres, the hillside ordinances are changing. Mm. And at that point, we get maxed out as far as what we can plant on this hillside. So mm. we are at maximum capacity as far as the grapevines go here in the property. But at least now you have some other signature flavors that you can work with. Definitely. When, when Delia, when she started making the Vietere, she made 1,500 cases of the, the Vietere blend mm. the first year that she made it. And when she hit the top 100 wines of the world this the first time, she made 1,500 cases of it. And at that point, she sort of decided that she would not lose the perspective of where she is, where she came from, and what she was doing. Mm. And she pretty much capped herself off at 1,500 cases on the production there. She felt where quality and quantity came mm. together. Right. She was at that sweet spot. Right. And she did uh -huh. not want to lose that, right. to leave that behind. And so pretty much every year of that Vieter blend, we make 1,500 cases of it. Mm. Some years we'll make quite a bit less. 2010, for an example, we only made 975 cases. It was a little bit of more of a, a challenging vintage for the winemaking. Uh, the wine mm. enthusiast actually just reviewed that one, gave it 97 points. Whoa. Uh, so we, we made 30% less, yeah. but in the long run, Quality is the number one concern. That was actually the nature of the year. The quality was wonderful if you got grapes. <laughs> exactly. And with we, our total production year is now at 3,000 cases. And what we're doing with the other 1,500 cases, we do make a pure Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm. We make a pure Cabernet Franc, mm. which is amazing. It's delicious, yes. Uh, we do make a pure Syrah. And the Syrah is sort of a fun wine. We make it like an old world, old world Syrah. We destem the fruit. We put it in oak, oak barrels. We add the stems back to the fermentation, oh. so essentially a full cluster fermentation, stems and all, manually punching the skins, the stems into the wine, and you end up with this very old world, funky, sort of northern Rome, yeah. chewy, juicy, meaty Syrah. Uh, that's only 150 case production wine, but a, a very fun wine that we're making. We also make a Petit Verdot based wine, that's cool. uh, which is amazing as well. We, do, uh, we actually soften the Petit Verdot with Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh. <laughs> sort of a backwards blending session. Uh, that's the wine we do about 150 cases of. And we'd make a speck of Malbec. And our newest addition to the lineup of wines that we're making is a Cabernet Sauvignon based wine mm. that we're blending Syrah mm. into. And we're adding Cabernet Franc mm. and also a little bit of Malbec. Nice. Uh, so a great summer sort of grilling barbecue red. I've seen some beautiful wines recently where they it's a Syrah mixed into a Cab. 
and they really marry quite well because oh, yeah. they, they fill in each other's blind spots, you might say. It's really nice. It's interesting. Uh, you, you go to Australia, the Cabernet Shiraz buns have been popular yeah, for yeah. 15, 20 years. Whereas you come to the Napa Valley and Cabernet sort of this holy grape yeah. that you don't want to blend with anything but traditional Bordeaux varietals. Right. I, I think you're going to see a lot more of these Cabernet Shiraz blends, mm. whereas I think you just stated it correctly. The, the Cabernet and, and the Syrah are so complementary. Mm. Uh, the Syrah adds a a softness, a juicy character. Uh, it rounds out the tannins quite beautifully. And for, for California, we love grilling, we love barbecuing. Mm. It's just sort of a perfect grilling, barbecue, uh, meat wine. And yeah. I think you're gonna see a lot more winemakers playing with Cabernet and Syrah in the future. I think that women winemakers are more willing to play with recipes sure. than men winemakers. And it's kind of the idea that, well, it's like with chicken soup. If my mom made chicken soup that way, that's how we're making it forever. You bet. But mom can say, wait a second, it's my chicken soup. I can oh, yeah. change it a little bit. I'm putting more carrots in this time. You bet. So women are more inclined to say, I can put my signature on this. And once one winery will experiment with something and someone else tastes it, they can say, you know, if they can do it, why can't I? Mm -hmm. You know, which just opens the door to some really interesting blends. Definitely. People's palates can get bored with you know, too much perfection sometimes. Oh yeah, definitely. And Cabernet has been, been the hot varietal yeah. for, for 20 years now, yeah. it seems. Well, it's a very profitable grape. Definitely. Yeah, if you're a farmer, that's definitely what you want to plant. Yeah. Very <laughs> profitable grape. There was a study recently about, they had they measured people's mental acuity and they exposed like guys to really beautiful girls and girls to really great looking guys <laughs> and found out that when encountering beauty, people go stupid. Uh -huh. <laughs> they just like lose it for a moment or two. They just sure. get dumb. And it's actually something I have seen when I brought people here and they walk out into the view. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I've noticed that your working style, your team's working style, is very conscious of that. Oh, yeah. You never stand in front of the view. No. You know, if you sit, you'll sit to the side a little bit. And you will present your thing and then give them time to just soak in it. Oh, yeah. Is that... Is that part of, am I reading that correctly? Definitely, with a view like this, even when someone walks in, you, of course you welcome them and smile at them, but you definitely want to lead them straight to the view, because right. that's, if you start talking about, about wine or the history, oh. it's, it's lost. You know, they're, <laughs> they're waiting to come out here and look at this view. And so you immediately you know, open the door, let's walk out, let's look at the view, and you gotta let them just soak it in for a couple seconds before you even say anything at all. And then you know, a great place for us to start is with the view. You know, point, point out Diamond Mountain right across the way from a Spring Mountain mm. down to our left, the town of Calistoga down here to the right. Mm. Working our way in, we have the water right in front of us, Bell Canyon Reservoir, up into the vineyards, Cab Franc in front of you, Cab Franc, Cabernet to the left, and then sort of work, work your way up back into the tasting experience. But you definitely have to start with the view. And with a view like this, it would be silly not to let the customer enjoy it with the guests that they're right. with. So we do, we do like to give them some private time out here where they can sit down, enjoy these amazing wines, look at this ridiculous view, and just even knowing about the history of the winery, thinking about this vineyard and the energy, the reflection off the sun, and tasting this wine with this dark fruit and this amazingly silk ripe tannin, mm. it gives you just such a great appreciation for this plot of land, this space on earth mm. where this grape is coming from. Hamon is a giant volcanic rock mm. that faces the afternoon sun mm. that heats up <laughs> throughout the day. Yeah, this vineyard sort of takes Hal Mountain to the extreme with the, re with the direct reflection off the, right. off the water. The vineyard itself, though, we have eight inches up to 18 inches of a loamy soil mm. before you hit solid volcanic rock. Oh, wow. And so not only the vines are sitting in that solid rock stressing out, mm dwarfing the size of the grapevine, the size of the berry, mm. uh, which gives you some amazing concentration mm. and flavor. But that rock is also heating up throughout yes. the day and pushing energy into the base of the vine. And oh. again, the, the tannin becomes extremely mature and just gives you that just beautiful texture, the oh. beautiful, soft, silky character to the wine. Uh, Jancis Robinson at one point reviews the Vieira wines. She calls the wine liquid cashmere. Oh. which is oh. sort of a perfect description of, yeah. of this vineyard and, and this personality. Mm. And for Delia with the winemaking, it's just showing you that exact personality oh. and, and not, not interpreting it too much, but just showing you what that vineyard has mm. to say. Yeah, lush and elegant. Oh, my gosh, yeah. really Perfect description, perfect description. That's yeah, an amazing spot. Yeah. 
We want to thank Viader Vineyards for their hospitality, and especially Shante Swearingen for sharing the story with us. Until next time, this is Ralph from Wine Country at Work. Cheers! <laughs>